Thank you, Brother Sullivan. Good evening, friends. Happy to be here again tonight in the service of our great King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trusting that He has been real good to you today and blessed you. And we're expecting tonight the exceedingly abundantly above all that we can do or think. It's kind of good to be up here tonight. My wife tells me down home it's fixing snowing down there, so I think I'll just stay up until high. <laughs> I've got a few days of a hope to rest if I can. I can't stay home. I just get home and leave again. Because it's worse at home than it is anywhere. At home. So I'm really tired. I've been going since Christmas. We started the two weeks in the tabernacle on the seven church ages. Left there and went down to Shreveport, Louisiana, married to Arlington, Texas, or I beg your pardon, Beaumont, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Long Beach, Visalia. California, now Tula, Tallow, California, then back up to Richmond, Virginia, and then over here. And I got up just, just about gone <laughs> when it comes physically speaking. But outside, I feel strong, but the, the inside, is what it is. <laughs> just get tired. Can't think right. But I believe that God will bless our efforts as we try to serve Him. The Lord bless you. I hope it don't freeze you, but I'm glad to turn that off. But it's a little so noisy. Can you hear me better now? That's good. Did somebody get some nails and fix this for us today? I hope so. <laughs> I was afraid it was going to fall off last night. I had it kind of cropped down here a little bit. Now we're going to approach the Lord tonight, His Word rather, upon a prophetic subject. One that I have thought of and talked of many times, but I want to kind of approach it in a standpoint tonight a little different because many of them calling me today and told me they couldn't hear back there. It was such a rebound and a rumble. You, you don't get the word too well. That's the essential part, is to get the word, because after all, it's the word that counts. The word of God is what counts. I hope I wasn't misunderstood last night by many of our brethren. You see, if we are approaching God, we have to come upon that his invitation of his word. We must be loyal to that word. And if you do anything or say anything or preach anything that's contrary to your real heart's conception, you can't have faith because you know that you're doing, you're not just exactly right. You've got to do just exactly the way you think is right and say just what you know to be the truth. If you don't do that, you can't have faith yourself. And your message will never get to the people because it can't be anointed. Because way down in this little buzzer down here, you're thinking something different than what you're saying up here. That just won't work. You've got to really be honest. And Hebrews, the 10th chapter that I was referring to last night, see, for if we sin willfully, see, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. And what I was trying to place, if you can hear me better tonight, see, those people had a promise of God, Israel. Can you all hear me now? Raise up your hands, all that can hear me. Good. Those people was promised of God the promised land. But when they got to the place to take over the promise, they doubted. And then they went back and died in the wilderness. Everyone that disbelieved that promise. Is that true? Raise your hands. Thanks. Everyone died. There's only two that believed it. Joshua 
Caleb. And the only two of that entire two and a half million people, they got to go in the land because they believed it. Now, the Old Testament is a type of the new, what I was typing it together. Today, spiritual Israel done the very same mistake that natural Israel did. And when they come up to the real place, you have passed a school of theology out there. Just exactly like they did in Exodus 19. They can't accept it. If it does, the organization puts them out. I had ministers before me today. Fine man. The Assemblies of God is one of my great supporters. The Church of God, a supporter. The Four Square, a supporter. The Oneness, a supporter. The Two-ness, a supporter. The United Pentecostal, a supporter. Pentecostal Holiness, a supporter. And some of the finest Christian ministers there is on the face of the earth is in them organizations. I don't pull any punches with those brothers. They're my brothers and they're a man of God. But the system, not the man, not the people, but the system winds them around and separates them from other brothers. They cannot do this when the system that they're under won't permit them to do it. That's what I'm against, brethren. I wouldn't want you to misunderstand me. I know that that's God's truth, and I know the thing has to die. Amen. Every type, shadow, and even the Scripture itself proves it. Therefore, I love my brethren in the assemblies and in all the other churches, the oneness and twoness. I've never made any difference amongst the people, what organization they belong to. As long as they're born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, they are my brothers. And I've tried to stand right in the breach and say, you are my brothers. Tonight, a meeting like this in the city, when I've got one man sponsoring me, Brother Sullivan, as far as I know, that's true. When we all are to be together, all the churches, that goes to show I'm just as much your brother here in the pulpit tonight as I was your brother out in Chautauqua. I'm the same person. I haven't changed. I just got the same message. Amen. I love you just as much. No matter what you ever do to me, that doesn't make me feel bad towards you. If it does, then I'm wrong too. And if I get up here and that really lay sin to the uh, and unbelief and things to the viewing line, just to be different, brother, I'm an unfit subject for this sacred place. I'm worse off than the man that's in scriptural error. Because I'm an era myself of trying to show off or do something that's different. If I don't do it from a godly conviction with brotherly love in my heart, I'm wrong. And that's the way I do it, my brother. I've got to face sick people, demon powers. How can I have faith when I'm up against something in, that, that I really do not believe? And trying to say, yes, it's all right, let's go ahead. I can't do that. It's just not my makeup. I, I, I wasn't made that way. The Holy Spirit won't let me be that way. I've got to be just what I am. And everybody knows me that way, and that's where I want to know everybody. Just what you are. Be just yourself. As Congressman Upshaw said one time, you remember him, was healed in a meeting, he's been after a cripple for 70, 66 years. He said, you can't be nothing that you hate. And that's right. Quicker Christians learn that, better off you'll be. The bootleg joint won't hurt the church so much. No, it's a man in the church that professes to be something that he hates. That's what it is. That's the person. It's true. Now, so you'll clearly understand from last evening, when they walked up face to face with the promise of God behind them, that all these things were for them, and failed to believe it, and wanted to go back again and start up their same old things like they was, God let them wander right there in that wilderness to every one of them died. 
And in Hebrews, now watch, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, said, if we sin willfully. Now what is sin, brethren? Unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. You commit adultery? Why? Because you're an unbeliever. You steal, lie, cheat? Why? Because you're an unbeliever. That's right. A real, true believer doesn't do that. See, he doesn't do it because the Holy Spirit in him, if he happens to even make a mistake, the Bible said also, the worshiper once purged has no more conscience of sin. He that's born of God does not commit sin. He's not an unbeliever. He's a believer. The Spirit of God remains in him. He cannot sin. He can't be a believer and unbeliever at the same time. You're either a believer or not a believer. Now listen to Scripture. The man or woman, it comes to a facts of the Bible. Comes up against the scriptural doctrine. Minister, whoever you are. Now I say this with godly love. And you see it and know it is the truth. And turn away from it. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a fearful looking for the judgment, the fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law, when they offered the little lamb, tucked the little fellow and plucked its little uh, throat and held its head and feel it quivering, dying, and the blood going out in the charger, and that was stored on the, as the prayer went up on the brazen altar of sacrifice and judgment, the altar of judgment, brass speaks of divine judgment. And that little lamb, after finally quit kicking, the worshiper standing there realized that it was his sins that did that. That ought to have been him. But the lamb took his place. Now the lamb sacrifice of the animal could never save the man. Because the life that was in that blood was animal life. It could not come back upon the worshiper. So sin was just covered. It was a, just to a, a wait till the real lamb come. It was an act of faith showing that a real lamb was coming. But then, then if he committed that same crime again, before that cleansing of the sanctuary, and he was recorded of committing adultery the second time, under two or three witnesses that proved that they saw him done it, he was stoned without mercy. No matter if he's a preacher, if he's a mayor of the city, who he was, he died without mercy. Hebrews, I'm looking at it. Hebrews 10th chapter. Died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you know what? Go worthy, being a minister, whoever you might be, profess the Holy Ghost who has trod underfoot the Son of God and considered the blood of Jesus Christ as an unholy thing. How much more punishment when you put your hands on the feet of the Lord Jesus and feel the pains and things that He died for you and confess Him as your Savior. It isn't an animal life there. Neither was it a man's life. It was God's life. And that spirit that was in Him comes back upon you and makes you a son of God. And if you walk up to face these facts, see, for if we disbelieve willfully any scriptural thing or whatever it might be, if we disbelieve willfully, so what do they say? We can't take it. They're too big for us. We can't. If I have to step out my organization, if I accept that, they'll turn me out. I won't have any place to go. Nobody to back me up. Who wrote the Bible? Your organization? Who's responsible for the Word? Your organization? God's responsible for His Word. God will take care of His own. God will back you up. Any man that ever mounted to very much in this life were a man who stood alone with God. That's the way if you ever stand, you'll have to stand. Now you walk up and say, like, you're, like you'd be a Methodist. And you walk up and it said the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And you see that that's true, how the power of God fell upon those people. And you say, 
it, it, I, I know that's the truth. But if I accept it, they will turn me out of the organization. They will. They sure will. Now you've got to make a choice. You know it's the truth. I see. He that disbelieves willfully after he's received the knowledge of the truth, disbelieves, turns away from that, there remaineth no more sacrifice or unbelief. You're finished and washed up forever. That's right. And a Pentecostal that'll walk up to that same place, them were uh, pre-Pentecostals. And they had the promise to take the land and every blessing God promised. God gave it to them. But because the opposition was so great, they turned back and lived in the wilderness for 40 years instead of facing the facts. That's the same thing that Paul's speaking about here in Hebrews 10. Do you understand now? Now that's scripture, my brother. And when a man turns his back upon truth and walks away from it willfully, after he sees it's the truth, he's a finished product of God. That's right. For there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a fearful looking for the judgment and the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. Because if they died under two or three witnesses under Moses' law on that kind of a lamb, how much more will eternal separation come to that guy that walks away from truth because of his organization or his mother, his daddy, or anything else that would keep him from going on with God? I hope you understand it. If, if I hurt you, I don't mean to. I'm just presenting a truth that I know is the truth. I had to face that, brother. And I know what it means. And I, I faced it. And the devil told me I'd starve to death and everything else and I'd be an outcast. And the, my pastor said you'll be a holy roller and you'll lose your mind and be in the insane institution. But it was God's word. And I faced it and received it. And I've never regretted it, but thank God for the Holy Spirit that led me to it ever since. And I've stood alone since then. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for every gracious word that's written in this Bible. Seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, two and a half million people die in perishing in the wilderness of unbelief, and only two that believed was permitted to go over. Father God, I pray you to help us to see that and, and look to what it means. Let us not be disbelievers in thy word, but may we be not only hearers, but doers of the word. Grant it, Lord. May we, out of this little meeting and I felt led to come here to my brother and to these fine people that's here in this city. And I come with the message that you put on my heart. Now, I can only sow the seed, Lord. You have to be the one to give the increase. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will water those seeds until it will bring forth a union among brethren and among organizations in this city, in this community, until they, it'll send the gospel light across the world. Grant it, Father. Help us tonight now as we further go advancing forward in faith into thy word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> I've got a little subject here that I have preached on it. But I want to take it in a prophetic way tonight. It's found in Genesis 22, 14. I want to begin. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as he said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. Now, this is on the life of Abraham, which is the father of us all. Now, how many know that we have 
to be Abraham's seed or we'll never get to heaven. We have to. Is it possible that we become Abraham's seed? How? Only one way in the world forever to become Abraham's seed, that's receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we just went through that in California, back and forth and back and forth through the mark of the beast and the seal of God. The only way we'll ever become Abraham's seed, because that gives us Abraham's faith. And Abraham never received this promise while he was in circumcision under the law, but when he was under grace before circumcision was ever issued. Therefore, it's not nothing that we could do to merit it. It's God's grace that gives it to us. By faith, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. The law was what man wanted. Not what God wanted. Now, we want to start in Abraham now. And I want you to listen real close if you can. And by the way... Was the, any, anybody, give, give out prayer cards out. I, I forgot to ask them, is there prayer, where's Billy? Was the prayer cards given out? Yeah. Yeah, there was prayer cards given out. Okay. All right. Then we'll perhaps pray for the sick at the end of this little service here. Now. Let's begin with Abraham and find out what Abraham was and how do we become his seed. And then if we can really get thoroughly based upon the word of the Lord, then it takes all the fear away from us if we know what we are doing. How would you go out and pick up, you gentlemen, young men here, would you walk out on the street and pick up a woman and marry her just because you walked out and picked her up she's a woman? I don't have... Much thoughts of your conception, if you would. But, see, first you've got to know something about her, where she come from, her character. That's with the woman to her husband. The same way, you must think of those things because it's your lifetime companionship. And this is our eternal life with God or be totally separated and annihilated in hell. It's one or the other. So we want to approach this upon the basis of Scripture and know where we are. Then you'll have faith to know. If you can see where you're going, then you have faith to go. But if you can't see where you're going, just stumbling through the dark, you don't know what you're doing. So Abraham, where we first read of him, you mark in Scriptures, I've seen many of you, and I say this reverently. I've watched last night and tonight to a certain lady here. I appreciate her. She reads that Bible everywhere I quote a scripture. She goes right to it. I like that. That's the way. Back it up. And you know you've got, thus saith the Lord. Someone called me and said, Brother Branham, of everything that you preach, you haven't preached one thing I've ever heard you in the last ten years but what I've found written on the pages of my Bible. And I like that, see? That's right. And said, I've listened to your tapes. Some of them has been criticized. But said, I've walked right to the critics and said, let me show it to you in the Bible. See? That's right. That's good. See, that's the Holy Spirit. It's in the Bible. Then it's right. Now, we pick up Abraham in the 12th chapter. Now, you follow me with the chapter. God met Abraham. He's just an ordinary man, an elderly man to begin with, the age of 75 years old. So, brethren, if you think you're too old to start out for God when you're uh, 50, 60, 70 years old, why, you're not. Abraham was 75 years old. His half-sister, who he married, Sarah, was at that time 65 years old, and they were barren, had no children. And God told Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation and make you a father of nations and give him a covenant. Now, first place, I want you to notice the covenant was not only made to Abraham, but to Abraham and his seed after him. Now, let's say that together. Now, we're getting ready for healing service. See? To Abraham and his seed 
after him. See? Now what God did for Abraham, he does for his seed after him. Now I'm going to prove that to you tonight by the Bible. And surely that will settle last night for you. See? Notice. To his Abraham on my right side and to his seed after him over here. Uh, I'm going to take uh, uh, two books and I'm going to lay them up like this so you'll see this is Abraham. This is the seed after him. Abraham and the seed after him. God, what he did to Abraham, he swore to Abraham and his seed after him. Now listen, close, don't miss this. Whose seed you are, if you are dead to the things of the world and been made alive in Christ by the Holy Spirit. For we which are dead in Christ take on Abraham's seed and are heirs with him according to the promise. The Bible. Now, did you notice the covenant that he made with Abraham in the 12th chapter of Genesis? The covenant was not, Abraham, if you'll do a certain thing, I'll do a certain thing. It, the covenant was altogether grace. No, if you will, it, God said to Abraham, I had. Not, if you'll do a certain thing. God made a covenant with Adam. Adam broke it. Every time he makes a covenant with man, Exodus 19, he made a covenant, broke it. But God in his determination, not by laws or covenants with man, but by covenants with himself, he was determined to save man. Because it's his son. So he, not only did he make this covenant, but he swore about it. And a man taking an oath takes for somebody an oath greater than he is. And there's no one greater than he was. So the Bible said he took an oath by himself to keep it. Think of it now. You say, well, if I just had the blessings of Abraham, if I just had the same promise that Abraham had, you have. If you are Christ's seed, if you are dead in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, you are Abraham's seed because Christ is Abraham's seed. You see it? That puts the inside of us working. Faith in God. Now, to be Abraham's seed, you would never back up in a promise of God. You'd always keep God's promises. You'd let that be truth no matter what anything else was. That's what Abraham did. No matter what anybody said, anybody said, that's nothing. God said so and that settles it. That's why Abraham seed. Look, how are you Abraham seed? Let God's word be true and everybody else is alive. God's word. So therefore, you see, if you come to it, profess to be Abraham seed and turn away, it's impossible. You turn yourself from God and there's no more sacrifice left for your unbelief. You're finished. See? Now, he made it to Abraham, not Abraham, if you will do a certain thing, I'll make a great nation of you and make you a father of nations. He said, I have done it. Remember, the promise was altogether grace and no law mixed in it at all. Not any ifs at all. It's absolutely God's choosing of Abraham. Now, even if you don't agree with some of this, just, just give it prayerful consideration. Now, you see, it isn't what you've done, what your desires are. It wasn't Abraham's desire, he was a heathen. If what he come down from the Tower of Babel, down in the valleys of the Shinar and the land of the Chaldeans and the city of Ur, and he was, he was just an ordinary man, and... Nothing Abraham done, not even his desires, but God, by grace and election, chose Abraham. That's why he chose you. Not nothing you done, what he done. I remember to Abraham and his seed, 
You think that you become a minister or a Christian because people talk good about you? Or you join church to stay in the society or this is the biggest church in the city? You're just fooling yourself. That's all. You're a miserable person when it comes to Christianity. God chooses by election. Romans the ninth chapter, eighth chapter, said that the election of God might stand sure. Esau and Jacob, before either child was born, had a way to even make a decision what they were going to do. God said, I hate Esau and love Jacob. Because God knew what they were before the world was ever formed. God chose you in Christ before the world ever come into existence. The Bible said so. Put your name on the Lamb's book of life. Not when you come to the altar, but before the foundation of the world he did it. The Bible said so. The Antichrist in the last days, so religious, even Pentecostal, till it would deceive the very elected if it were possible. Billy Graham said the other night in his message, he said, The devil is so roaring about till he's absolutely deceived the elected. I thought, oh, oh, Billy, you made a mistake there. Uh, you can't deceive the elected because they're secured with Christ. The Bible said that this Antichrist would be so close that he would deceive the elected if it was possible and that what he would do in the last days he would be so close how he would do that. And he said he would deceive all upon the face of the earth. Revelations. I'm quoting whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. That's Abraham's seed. God's choosing, not yours, God's. God chose you. He never chose God. God chose you. And put your name in the Lamb's book of life. When was the Lamb slain? 2,000 years ago on Calvary? Not in God's sight. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When God saw the, what Satan had done, his program was laid out, and he knew that he would send his son and he would be a propitiation for our sins, and in the mind of Jehovah to conquer and peak his people, he slayed the lamb in his own mind before the foundation of the world and put your name on the book as we do. Glory! That's what he done. God did that. And what are we scared about? Not if you will, I have. Then you'd say in divine healing, Brother Ben, will God heal me? Your Abraham's seed, he has healed you. Will you lay your hands on me way Brother Roberts does? That don't have nothing to do with it. Just a point of contact. Watch the man's own sermon. Say, put your hand up on the back of the seat behind you. Now the seat ain't got no healing in it. See? It's your faith in a finished work that you're already redeemed. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Brother Bram, will I get healed tonight? You're already healed. God sent the Holy Spirit. He sent your pastors and they preached the word. You listen and he sends gifts of tongues interpretation. Sends prophets and prophetic gifts and everything trying to draw you to the place. The pastor can't heal you. The speaking in tongues doesn't heal you. The interpretation doesn't heal you. The prophet doesn't heal you. The other gifts doesn't heal you. It only points you, if it's a true gift, it only points you to where you were healed. For you're the seed of Abraham. And you were already healed and saved. And that's why the Holy Spirit knocking at your heart. All the Father has given me will come to me. Right. Now that's why we preach the gospel. That's why I put forth these efforts. That's what other ministers put forth their efforts. Is to try to swing out that big net. 
draw it in and see what is what. I don't know. The other ministers doesn't know. We're just saying him. The kingdom of God is like a fisherman went to the net, took a net, went to the sea and cast it in. When he pulled in, he had frogs, turtles, serpents, spiders, and fish. <laughs> Watch what happened. The influence of the gospel catches many. And just about the first week after, the old serpent said, Now look, if I'm going to have to do all this other stuff, give up my cards, my tobacco, <laughs> right back to the water he goes. Mrs. Water Spider sits there and she looks around she says, Huh. You mean I can't have my clubs and do these things there and I have to take off my makeup, let my hair grow out and take off my shorts and huh, plop, plop, plop. Just a hog to its waller and a dog to its bond. Now, what was she? She was caught in the net, brought up to the altar. He was too. But he was a snake to begin with. He was a spider to begin with. The net had nothing to do with it. It only pulled him up here. And the fish was a fish to start with. It's exactly right. My sheep hear my voice. See? Or some of them are smart and educated and shrewd as they can be. That has nothing to do with it. It's humility and the Holy Spirit guide and leading. And he'll never lead you one word from that Bible. He'll keep you right in line with that Bible. That's right with the Bible. When you see a scripture, and you see here, and here, and here, and here, and you ask your pastor about it, he says, Ah, oh, that was for another day. If you're a child of God, you won't believe that. No, sir. When it said, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever, works that I do, shall you do also? You see what he was? See the promise here? The pastor said, Ah, oh, that's nonsense. There's nothing to that. You won't believe it. Because you're not a spider nor a snake, you're a fish. See? There it is. You're not a goat or a pig, you're a lamb. And the dove cannot light on nothing but a lamb, it's the same nature. The greatest thing, I believe I preached that message up here one time, the lamb and dove. It's the greatest message I ever was given to me of the Lord. When God represented himself, he represented himself from heaven, a bird. The meekest of all the birds, the dove. And God and the Holy Ghost is the same self person. If it didn't, Jesus had two fathers. Je and Matthew 1.18 said, That which is conceived in me is of the Holy Ghost. He was the bastard child. He was holy born of God. So he, he, he was the son of God. That's right. So, when he came descending from heaven, not another three people way up there are talking, but they saw the Spirit of God like a dove. That's who the Spirit was, not the third person talking. It's not three gods, it's three offices of the same God. God the Father in a pillar of fire. God the Son in human flesh. God the Holy Ghost in you, the same God. Jesus said that day you'll know that I'm in the Father, Father in me, and I in you, and you in me. God trying to get back to fellowship with his creature that he created in the Garden of Eden. He can't disobey his own laws. Man was sinful. When he settled on Mount Sinai, if anyone touched them out, must be thrust through the dark. But when he was made flesh, we could touch him. Now he becomes part of us. See, to lead us and guide us, fellowship with us again. Oh, my, my, how scrupled and uncouth that people takes God's word and make it. And then somebody would get a little bit of light on it, run over here and organize and make an organization and fuss at the next couple. Why don't you just say there's room for us all? Let's all march towards Zion. We're not divided. We are Christians. Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Pentecostal, Oneness, Twoness, Threeness, Assemblies, Church of God, all. We are not divided. We are Christians. When we receive Christ as our personal Savior and be filled with the Holy Ghost, we are God's sealed product. Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Ghost, whereby you're sealed until somebody makes you mad. 
Well, or for two or three years, until you disobey God once. And those, you might find that in the old lady's birthday almanac, but you don't find it in God's Word. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. Your eternal destination is decided by God, and then you're sealed in there. That's what he did Abraham. Abraham believed him, and he was imputed to him for righteousness. Then he gave him the seal of circumcision as a confirmation. And I have done it. You're my property. Amen. That's it. Now, Genesis, the 12th chapter. Not if you will, I have. Now, let's go to Genesis, the 15th chapter. That's where he confirmed the covenant to Abraham. Now, listen close. He confirmed the covenant or signed the contract with Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis. Now, we find out that Abraham said, Lord, what would you give me, seeing that I go barren? He's getting to be an old man this many years later. He said, seeing that I go barren... And the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. What would you give me? And God told him to take a she-goat of three years old, a heifer of three years old, and his sacrifices and the sheep three years old, ram, and to go up and he split those sacrifices open and took a pigeon and a turtle dove. Can you hear me say amen? amen. All right, I'll be, I want you to get this now. Now, he's going to confirm this covenant to Abraham or sign the contract with him. He's already told him, I'll give it to you. That's a promise. Now, he's going to sign it and prove how he's going to do it. So, Abraham done all these things and he watched the sacrifices, kept the birds off of them until the sun went down. They're not, the sacrifice is not to be contaminated, you know. So, he kept the birds off till the sun went down. And when the sun went down, now listen... A deep, horrible darkness of sleep come up on Abraham. You remember that? That represents death to every man. And before him was a smoking furnace. Every sinner deserves to go to hell. But beyond that went a little white light. See, every man dies the death of separation. And hell is his doom. But beyond the reach of that went a little white light. Watch them. They went in between those sacrifices. In between the, the she-goat, the heifer, the ram. He, he took and went in between them confirming to Abraham what he was going to do. Now every clergyman here or anywhere will admit, Dr. Schofield here admits it, all the rest of the great clergyman knows that that's when God confirmed the covenant with Abraham. Now, what was he doing, Brother Branham? You call this the confirmation of the covenant. What was he doing? Here's what he did. He was proving to him what he was going to do with him. Now, what do we do when we make a covenant with one another, sign a contract with one another? Usually, we may go out and have a sandwich together, a cup of coffee or something. And then after it's all over, we walk up and take hold of one another's hand and say, Shake, boy. All right, I'll agree. I'll agree I'll do a certain thing. If I made a covenant with, uh, with some brother, with like Brother Gene Gold sitting here, I said, Brother Gene, uh, uh, Tuesday I'll go with you down in Kentucky on a certain errand. Okay, Brother Brennan, put her here. See, that's a covenant. If these two Arkansas brothers sitting here, if I say... I've been begging me for the last few years to come to Arkansas again. If I called you up here and said, Brother, I don't even know your names, but if I said, I'll make a covenant with you, a promise that next week I'll come down to Arkansas. Thank you, Brother Brandon. It's an agreement, a covenant. That's why we would sign it with a handshake. Isn't that right? Now, in Japan, you know how they make a covenant with one another? They talk things over and then take a little cruise of salt and throw salt on one another. That's salt's got life. You see, it contacts holes. Salt keeps. 
And that's why they throw salt on one another. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. They, and when they make a covenant one another, they throw salt on one another. That means that their covenant must keep. Salt holds them together. Keeps it from spoiling. Nothing can spoil our contract. It's a covenant. Our handshake is fellowship. We agree upon the basis of fellowship that we'll keep our covenant one to another. Salt will keep our covenant because it will not mire or spoil. Our covenant will always be kept. But in the days of Abraham, it was different. Now, when they made a, a covenant in them days, what they done was kill a sacrifice, split it open, walk in between it, and then they didn't have paper. Paper was just recently, a few years ago, found by the, the hornets that was building their nest out of the pulp out of the tree. But they didn't have paper. But they had, they put all their parsnips and so forth on skins. Lamb skin, they would tan it. And then draw these letters and, and make, write out their writings. All the old ancient writings was either on rock or on skin. So they take it either on rock or skin and they made this covenant with one another. Then they walked in between these sacrifices, these two pieces of the dead animal. And then they broke this in two, or tore it in two. One tuck one and one another, and tuck an oath. If we break this covenant between us, let our bodies be like this sacrifice that stands for it. You see what I mean? Now what was God doing? He was showing to Abraham what he was going to do in the future through the seed of Abraham as which he had not yet. Oh, brother. He didn't have it yet, but he had the promise, and that was as good as done. Hey, man. Say, well, my hand's crippled. I'm a seed of Abraham. I don't see my hand like that no more. It's as good as done. God promised it to me. It's over. No matter what my hand is, it's what God said. That's the real seed of Abraham. The doctor says there's no chance for you to get well. Lord, what about that? The Father speaks back in your heart, I'm the Lord that heals all thy diseases. Oh, doctor, you're a fine man, but it's finished. I'm healed. God said so. That's true. That's Abraham's seed. God said so. I'm healed. Yes, sir. Can you eat yet? I'll make a difference. I'll heal anyhow. See? Abraham waited 25 years for that promise to come. Got stronger all the time. We come in the prayer line, get prayed for. Say, well, I still got them cramps. I, I still feel bad. I can't walk anymore. Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed denies anything that's contrary to it. If it's revealed to you. Now, I never healed a man in my life. Neither did Oral Roberts or Tommy Hicks or anybody else or any other person in the world ever heal a man. If you see, you're trying to make man somebody great. All brothers so-and-so lay their hands on me, chills run through me. That was just a sensation. That's all. You're not healed by sensations. You're healed by faith. You don't have to feel nothing. You don't feel nothing unless it's a sensation. You believe. Jesus never said, did you feel it? Did you feel it? Did you feel that? Find me one scripture for that. He said, did you believe it? Faith. God said so. I'm his Abraham's seed. I believe God. That settles it. So see, it isn't some great big healer comes to town. Your pastor has the same authority of any other man. Your neighbor, your Christian sister, your Christian brother, all of anybody. Anybody has a right to pray for you. The Bible said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other. All of us. See? But we try to make some man great, big, and cost us a million dollars to sponsor a program. Don't get you healed. It's your own faith in God that does the healing. If you just believe what he said, you just wrote out a covenant with you. He give you the Holy Ghost for confirmation. Oh, my, that's it. See, that's the reason I don't like to put hands on people. Somebody say, Brother Bram laid hands on me. Glory to God. 
Brother Ben had nothing to do with that. Don't put your hands on me or me on you. Put your hands on him by faith and believe it. That's where it's at. That's your pastor to pray for you. Prayer changes things. What does it do? It doesn't heal you. It gives you faith to accept what's already been done. You're healed. You understand it? Now, what was he saying to Abraham? I'm going to fake the covenant like this, Abraham. And he took Abraham and showed him what he was going to do with Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. Because through Abraham come Isaac, through Isaac come Christ. Through Christ, the supreme sacrifice was made. All these others was natural seed. Israel, 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 Israel. But through Christ opened the veil to either Jew or Gentile, Greek, bond or free, male or female, that we all might enter into the Shekinah glory, which is only for Jews alone, but now it's for whosoever will. Let him come, let him come. That was the seed that God was talking about. What did he do with that seed? He took him to Calvary. He tore him apart. He died under the judgments, the divine judgments of God. We all know that as Christians. What did he do? He raised, he tore his soul from his body. His spirit, his life went out of his body. Water, blood, and spirit came from his body. And on the third day, God raised up his body and set it on his right hand in heaven and sent the Spirit out of that body back to us. Then, you see what he was doing? A denomination? If you're depending on that, you're lost. There's only one thing that will ever, when them contracts come together, them letters the way they was torn, they had to dovetail every letter and every piece of torn, haired sheepskin or rock had to dovetail right together. Nothing could substitute it. It had to be just exactly the same in the confirmation of this. If they brought another piece and tried to make it, uh-uh, it wouldn't blend in with it. It had to blend just exactly the way that was. And when the church is redeemed and rises in the resurrection, we are the bride of Christ. I'll say that readily, hoping we are, believing we are, by faith we are. The bride of Jesus Christ will have to have the same spirit in it that the other part of the contract had when it was here on earth. You see what I mean? God confirmed. Then the same life that was in Jesus will be in his church and the church will be doing the same things that Jesus did. He that believeth in me the works that I do shall he do also. And how could an unbeliever see the works of God and cause it beels above mental telepathy or see the works of our Lord? How? It's, it's all smart, educated, sure, but a million miles away from the things of God. See, he confirmed the covenant in Genesis, the 15th chapter. You get that out there, each one of you now? Genesis, the 15th chapter, he confirmed the word. And remember, listen now, he never confirmed it to him until he completely obeyed God. And he won't confirm it to you until you'll completely surrender everything. Now, I want you to keep these in mind. Our little Amish sister, or Dunker, Mennonite, whatever it is there, you get that I hope. Now, he confirmed the word. Now, let's go again. Oh, we could just stay on here for hours, but we haven't got the time. Now, let's go to Genesis, the 17th chapter. All right? When he gave him strength. Now, in Genesis 17, chapter, the first verse, God appeared to Abraham as the almighty God. Abraham was 99 years old. 
Sarah was 89 years old. And since he was 75 and Sarah 65, they've been waiting for this promise, getting stronger all the time that God was going to do it. Never moved from what they believed. That's the way. Now he seen God saw that he was determined to hold on. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. When God sees your heart, when he shows you something in regardless of what anybody else says about it, it's his word and you stay with it. Not turn away willfully, ignoring truth, but walk in it. God said so. God is a spirit. He leads his people in spirit and truth and his word is the truth. And Jesus was his word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh in all the moments. Now, he appears to you in there as Almighty God. From the Hebrew word is El Shaddai, which means shad, means breast in the Hebrew. Now, he wasn't the breast God, but Shaddai, which the plural, breasted God. I am the breasted God, the strength giver, the sufficient one, the life giver. In other words, he appeared to Abraham at 99, and Abraham was no more man, uh, speaking in terms of human terms, than a little bitty nursing baby would have been that was sick. His manhood was gone and Sarah's womb was dead. But he said, I am El Shaddai. I am the breasted mother God. Like the little baby. He's sick and threatened. His strength's gone. He's lost. He's laid out there. He's so sick and he's Hides all stretched in like them little babies in India. See, it's the most pitiful thing. Their little belly swelled up from hunger. The little mother laying there dying. The little baby's gums just leaning out. You see his gums to its lips. All the meat's gone. The little skull, where it goes together, you can see it. Laying there, can't cry no more. It's so hungry. Mother reaching to give the baby, take it. What if you take this and look at the thousands of more laying here? And we Pentecostals build millions of dollars of buildings and we're real Christians. I don't see it myself. No. Raking out enough to feed them. Now, that's not what somebody else told me. That's what I know myself. I've, I've been there. That's what the, the money that the people gives me in love offerings. What I do with it, I go there to feed them and give them food and tell them about Jesus. That's exactly. Nothing, we ain't got nothing here. Jesus, I believe he's coming soon. I ain't got no time for great big things and these kind of things here. Let's get the message to the dying. That's what he's waiting on us to do. That's what the message is. Go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Not go make organizations, build denominations, and build big buildings and things. That's all right. I ain't got nothing against it. But it ain't what Jesus said. He never said go make organizations. Go build big churches. Big buildings. He said, preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The power and demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Now watch the conjunction and the conjunction ties the sentence together. These signs shall follow them that believe. You just can't take the word alone. You've got to have the thing to back it up to make them signs follow it. Don't go educate the heathens. Go preach the gospel. Demonstrate the power of God before them. But we've done other things. See what I mean? Now, the little baby, he, Abraham's like that little baby. Belly swell. All hopes is gone. But I am El Shaddai. Just lean up here on my bosom and nurse yourself back to strength again. Oh, seed of Abraham. That's what he's doing to you. This is his promise. Don't take something bogus to it. Take the promise. Don't take what anybody else has got anything to say about it. Let every man's word be a lie, no matter how true and scientifically proved that it is. Let God's word be true. 
Get right up on the breast of God. Breasted. New and Old Testament. Wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we were healed. If you've got an a outlet to that breast that he healed you, then take a hold of it. What is the outlet? By his stripes we were healed. That's to the seed of Abraham. You say, I haven't got the Holy Ghost. He was wounded for our transgressions. Repentance. Baptism. And you shall receive the Holy Ghost. The promise is to you and to your children. Them as far off as many as the Lord our God shall call. The breast is open. To whosoever will believe it. If you're sick and needy. Not I will if you do so and so. It's already paid for. The supply of nourishment. The nourishment's already paid for. Jesus paid for. I'm the breast of God. Come whosoever will. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian and all. Lean upon my bosom. I am the breasted God. For my children, Abraham's seed. See what I mean? And the little baby, not only is he a breasted God, he's a satisfied. The little baby take hold of its mother's breast. I hope that's not too plain for the mixed audience. But the little baby take a hold of its mother's breast. It's not only drawing its strength out of the mother, but it's satisfied while it's doing it. <laughs> he knows that's his mama. Hallelujah! And a man or a woman that can lean upon God's bosom. That's my Father who created heavens and earth. He made me, He made me a new creature after He made me a creature of time. Now He makes me a creature of eternity. He was the one who gave the promise. I'm satisfied. I don't care if my stomach's hurt, my head's hurting, my hands is this way or that way. I am satisfied. I'm nursing from the promise of Almighty God. That's His promise. Amen. Strength giver. You're going to die. Oh, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Oh, I don't want to die. I'm crying. And the first thing you know, a still small voice through a sermon, through reading the Word, through in prayer somewhere. I am your healer. I am El Shaddai. Oh, is that I was wounded for your transgressions. With my stripes you were healed. Oh, what will I have? Nothing. Nothing. It's already the only thing you have to do is accept it. Well, if I'll, if I'll uh, uh, rejoin, if I'll leave the oneness and join the assemblies, or join the, leave the assemblies and join the oneness, will you, will you, not nothing to do with that? That has nothing to do with it. You don't have to join nothing. He's already witnessed your his child. Lean on my bosom and just keep nursing. Oh, doctor comes and says, well, doctor, you know, I want to tell you something. I want to pay you for your scientific service. You sure did help a lot and give me a lot of consolation. But when you got the end of your road, uh, that's all you can do. Yeah, I, and you, you're going you're to die. You might as well make... Well, doctor, I'm going to sign this check and give it to you. But I want to say something, doctor. I'm not going to die. <laughs> you're what? I'm not going to die. How do you know you're not? I'm nursing <laughs> my strength back from El Shadia. <laughs> I'm... Oh, they go out and say, let them alone. They, they won't hurt them. Just let them alone. They, they'll not. They, it's all. They're going to die anyhow. But you know what you're talking about. They right there. How do you know? It's a promise. Abraham, how do you know you're going to have that baby? It's a promise. See? El Shaddai. Well, what did you do? If you get well, what did you? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, oh, did you pay the preacher? If you did, you did wrong. <laughs> did you? Uh, what did you do? I didn't have to do nothing. Why? It's already done. I just believed it. He spoke to me, called me, and I received the bosom. And now I'm wet. How many has experienced that? Oh, God, sure. Now, we just don't have enough time to, to, to preach the way I like to preach. I'm not much of a preacher, but I like to talk about what I know. See? Look. Now, let's take this. Now, what did he do? Now, to use, or keeping your scriptures. Now, what was the covenant made? Now, we're going to change the position here just a minute for the next chapter. Now, what did he do? Make the covenant with Abraham. Say it with me. Abraham 
and his seed. What is the seed of Abraham? The born again man that's and woman that's filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, now, Brother Branham, all right, we'll see if he kept his promise. Abraham in Genesis 12 was justified, called out by justification and believed God's word. Is that right? So was the church in Martin Luther. Is that right? Genesis, the 15th chapter, he separated him when he completely obeyed and confirmed the covenant to him by blood. Hebrews 13, 12 and 13, Jesus suffered without the gate that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Is that right? What did he say? A message to the earth, a messenger. Who was it? In the Philadelphia church age, John Wesley preaching sanctification. That's when he confirmed it. Separated him from sin. He believed through justification. Genesis 12. He confirmed the covenant by blood, spilling the blood of a ram and so forth on the 15th chapter and sanctified the church. Now the 17th chapter, he gave the Holy Spirit. Notice, I am El Shaddai. Remember, he's going to receive something into him now from God. Strength. Some of, like the baby draws the mother's own strength from the body of the mother through nursing, the church was given the Holy Ghost, drawing the strength of the Spirit into them, nursing it back. He gave the church the Holy Ghost, the strength giver. His own strength, God giving an outlet to his weak child that's confessed his faith to give him strength. For something. He's ready to do something for him now. Justification. Abraham. Justification. Genesis 12. Martin Luther to the seed of Abraham. Sanctification. Genesis 15. Confirmation of the covenant. His seed of Abraham. John Wesley. Sanctification. Abraham had an outlet to draw from his weak condition, strength, God's own strength. Do you see it? How many seeds that say amen? amen? God's own strength nursed through a promise. He gave it to the Pentecostals, the Holy Ghost, drawing God's own life right out into them. As it did it natural there, he does a spiritual here. See, to Abraham and his seed after him. You get what I mean now? Now remember, the church is still advancing. Now, also, in the 18th chapter, now here's a little bit. Uh, this, you may disagree with this, brother. Now you, many of you, now you think Luther would believe anything else but justification? No, sir. That was his age. I believe he'll come in the resurrection, sure. All right. Sanctification. Could you tell a good square back Methodist that sanctification isn't the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You sure couldn't. <laughs> the entire sanctification is the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. You Nazarenes and pilgrim holiness and so forth. How you believe that? Yes, sir. Sanctification is the Holy Ghost. It's not. It's works of the Holy Ghost, not the filling of the Holy Ghost. No, sir. Long come Pentecost with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Exactly right. But now we want to stop the Pentecostal church just a minute. Each of those organized and died in their tracks. Now, I want you to look. You just put down the scripture. The fourth and fifth verse. After he had called him the justification, sanctified him through the blood of the covenant, Give him his own life in 17th chapter, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, what comes next in Israel? Some of you Bible scholars. The placing of a son. In the Old Testament, when a son was born into the family, he was a son. But he was not heir yet. See, the father didn't know what that boy would be. Is that right? 
So he had a tutor over him to raise him to a certain age, and then to you ministers, the placing of a son. God did the same thing in Revelation and Matthew the seventeenth chapter. He took Peter, James, and John, went up on a high mountain. I preached on that once here, up on a mountain, and was transfigured before them. What was he doing? He was showing the placing of a son. Now notice, in the Old Testament, they had the son was born, he was a son, but he had a tutor to watch him. The see how he come along and he the father always but the best teacher he could to his son, any father would. And so the, the tutor watched the son, and if the son was just a renegade, he didn't pay no attention, he wouldn't listen. He was still a son. Because he's born and he's a son. But he never had any inheritance. Please, brethren, put on the spiritual thinking now, and sister. He never had any inheritance, yet he was a son. Father taking care of him. That's that group back there in the wilderness. He had, he was a son, truly, but he never had any inheritance. And then the tutor would come up before the father and he'd say, how's my son doing? How he must have blushed and said, he, 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 uh, he isn't doing too good. See, he hired a man that was just and honest, that not a straw in his hat or feathers, we call it, but he was telling the truth. Your son's not doing too good. He won't listen. I can't teach him nothing. All right. He never got any inheritance. But what if he come and said, I wonder today that when God did the same thing to Abraham's seed, his children here, when the tutor, who is our tutor? The bishop? The district presbyter? Who is it? The Holy Ghost! He don't pull no punches. He tells the father exactly what's going on. He comes up and said, how's my children getting along down there? Oh, Father, all your daughters have cut their hair. They're wearing makeup. They're acting like the world. They put on immoral clothes. Clothes that look like men. They call them pedal pushers and slacks. And your women, your daughters, are just climbing right into that. And Father, the bad man, your sons, your preachers, permit it. Oh, yes, sure. They permit them. All the things that you talk because they're afraid. How the father must feel. He can't take them any farther. His children, he has to take care of them. Oh, what a, a burdened child that is. Well, why don't they do it? Well, they made themselves an organization. They kind of cuddle themselves together like they did to build the Tower of Babel. Yes, father says it'll come to the same kind of an end, too. And they built himself a tower that they thought through their organization they could draw the whole world to them. But just look what they're doing. Oh, it discourages the Father. How he must feel, embarrassed how the Holy Spirit must feel to take that word to glory. See how the church is getting along. How that they're accepting man-made doctrine instead of the Bible. The truth presented right to them and they turn their back and walk away from it. There you are. Because their organization don't believe it. Yet they know it's the Word of God. No other scripture in the Bible but that. If it's truly the Word of God, it'll be from Genesis or Revelations. It'll be the same thing. They accept sprinkling instead of baptism. They do all these other things. All kinds of creeds and everything else. How a father must feel. Hmm. He can't give that son nothing. But what if he comes up and says, But there are certain ones. I'm telling you. They are really your sons. I don't care what takes place. They stand for what you say. They're, they just act like it. That man just exactly acts like it. He, he, he says the same thing you do. If the hard servant is doing a certain thing, he don't care. It's his father's business. <laughs> I must be about it. He tears it up and says, You shall not do that to my father. My father said so and so, and you took the commandments of God and made them a tradition of man. No such a scripture in the Bible for such stuff as that. Oh, so that's my son. Yeah, then he really believes my word, just like Abraham. So he's Abraham's seed, truly. So, now what did the father do? Then he took a certain day after this son was proved... Now, Pentecost thought as soon as you was born again, got the Holy Ghost, that's all it was. You just got started then. Watch what he did to Abraham. 
Then what did he do? The father taking the child out, and he made a feast. Now, all you Bible students know this. Made a feast, set his son up in a public place, put him on a nice robe, and set him up there, and performed the duties of adoption, or placing. How many knows that's true? Say amen. Bible. Go back in Galatians, the fourth chapter, and pick it up there. Paul talking about it. He placed that son. What did he do? He had a ceremony of adoption. Placing that son. And then after he seen that son was going to do it, he's going to keep the promise. Nobody's going to keep him from it. He's just like his daddy. He's going to stay right with it. Cut and let the chips fall wherever they want to. He pulls no punches. And he said, I can put trust in that boy. So he form, performs the adoption. And what does he do? After he's performed the adoption, that child is a place son then in the, the Father's kingdom and has co-equal rights to it. And otherwise, if they wrote a check, his name is just as good on the check as his daddy's was. Then he's adopted or placed. God did the same thing to Jesus upon Mount Transfiguration. When, what did he do? He overshadowed him, taking him up in a public place. Taking three witnesses, Peter, James, and John, brought through witnesses from heaven to show three is a witness. And when he overshadowed him in his raiment, his pretty robe he put on him, a glorified condition, shine like the sun in his strength. Is that right? And a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Amen. I place him positionally. That's my son. What he says, I back up. He's kept my words. He's fought through all these denominations and everything else and kept the faith. He, he's pulled no punches. He, he's been true. He's always about my word. When people look at him, they see me. This is my son. Hear ye him. Did he just promise that to him? No, through him come the seed of Abraham, but the same thing. Fourth and fifth chapter, God took Abraham out and placed the adoption upon him and changed his name. Lord. From Abram to Abraham. Abraham comes from the word of Elohim, God's own name. He associated his name with God's name. God is Elohim. How many knows that? The great Jehovah Elohim. The all-sufficient one. The self-existing one. Elohim. And what did he do? He took the H-E-M off of his name and placed it onto Abraham's name because he was Abraham. God is the father of all, and Abraham is father of nations. Glory! Elohim, father of all. Abraham, father of nations. Placing positionally. Glory! That's after his church received the Holy Ghost. After they went through the testings. See, Pentecost missed that. They organized themselves and they couldn't get any for them. Then when God does a certain thing, say, ah, ah, stay away from it. Our church don't teach that. <laughs> Go ahead, but here's what he done to Abraham. To Abraham and his seed after him. Now, we're in Genesis 18. Still in the 18th verse. Now let's watch. Then he take him after he did that. Now that's the second thing he done. First thing, he give him justification, 12. 15th, to give him sanctification. 18th, to give him the Holy Ghost. At the end of the... Watch it quickly now. All these others took years. Are you listening? Do you love it? All these years from justification to sanctification was a lap of years. From sanctification till the confirmation, the Holy Ghost was years. But in the same chapter... He placed him after the Holy Ghost. Pentecost is just 40-something years old, you know. 
He began to place his sons. Martin Luther preached justification. Years and years and years come sanctification. Years and years and years come the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But right quick, after the Pentecost did the same thing the rest of them did, then he began to pull his sons that stood for his truth. And he gave him something special, magnified him before the people with a certain thing that he stood out. See? Placed him. Now, then in the same chapter, he gives him a sign, gives the Pentecostal church a sign of the end time. After Abraham had had his name changed a few days, been placed then as Elohim associated with God. <laughs> oh, you go, isn't it good to be a holy roller? <laughs> See, placed him, associated him with God, give him part of his name. And what kind of a name does his church have? His name. Is that right? I come in my Father's name and you receive me now. Jesus' name. If another will come in their name, his name, organization name, him you will receive. <laughs> but he associated Abraham with his name. And his church has his name. Many fine women in this world tonight, but there's one Miss William Branham. She's the one who goes with me. One church that lives in the name of Jesus. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Could you smoke a cigarette in the name of Jesus? Could you tell a lie in the name of Jesus? Could you steal in the name of Jesus? Could you turn away from God's truth in the name of Jesus? Certainly not. But well, whatever they do in word and deed, they do it all in the name of Jesus. Right. There you are. So shade a name after the adoption. After the adoption. Now he says, there's going to be a destruction. Sodom's going to burn. And I know I'm getting late, but I just got to stay with this just a few minutes longer. Of course, tomorrow night I want to say something else. Just bear with me a few minutes longer, will you? Notice, he changed his name and then gave him a sign that the end was at hand. Abraham then went out. Set one hot morning in the tent door, got up around noontime, and he looked and he saw three men coming. And Abraham knew that there was something strange about him. So I run out. Somebody said the other day, a converted Jew, said that showed that them three men was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Nonsense. He didn't say, My Lord's, as a heathen, he said, My Lord. Lot was the one called the two angels, lords. The backslider down there shows exactly where that same class lives today. Makes God four or five different people. God's one God. My Lord, said Abraham. Lot said, my lords, uh, for two of them. But there's three of them there. And Abraham recognized that there's one God in them. My Lord. Look at it. And remember, it wasn't a little Lord, it was Elohim. My Lord, Elohim, Jehovah. Walked up to the tent, oh, listen to this. Everybody was trembling. The first thing you know, they sat there and carried a conversation. Wish I had time to stress it. You just read the 18th chapter. How they sat there. Now wait, what's he doing? He's showing to Abraham this what he's going to do to the Abraham seed. Now, what was he on the road? After Abraham, after he had been justified, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and types and shadows, and had been placed, then he came, and he was giving a sign that the end was at hand. he come down to destroy the wicked, sinful world of Sodom. Is that right? Now, I remember, Jesus said, do you believe him? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, there was, they stood and talked. Watch two angels, two angels went down into Sodom to preach the gospel. Is that right? Two angels went down in Sodom to preach the gospel. A modern Billy Graham, 
preaching to them sinners and so forth. No miracles they've done. One miracle, smite and blind, preaching the gospel, blinds the unbeliever. And so they went down there to preach the gospel. And that was their sign, preaching the gospel. Come out of this place. God's going to burn it. Is that right? It's going to burn. Get out of here. That's the evangelist Billy Graham. And them fellows preaching. But watch this one and stay back to the church elected. Abraham. The seed of Abraham. See, that was Lot down there in his group. Now, there's always three classes of people. The unbeliever, the make-believer, and the believer. See? Now, the unbeliever and the make-believer stays together. But the real believer separates himself what makes him the church. You follow me? Now, all those big organizations down there and all of them cooperating had great time. And some people laugh at Billy Graham. Let me stop here just a minute. Say, a man that's influenced like Billy Graham so many people, why isn't he Pentecostal? He can't be. Has Billy Graham got a part in it? Yes. You spiritual people, wake up now just a minute. What you're thinking on? What is his name? G R A H A M. I know you think that's crazy. Just wait a while. H A M. Abraham. See? He's got a message of repentance. And there's nobody you can get to smear one thing on that man's message. He's got repentance down to the key. That's right. He preaches it like a house on fire. See, that's right. God called him to do that. He's going where? Not to the Pentecostals, but to that denominational groups out in that mess out there with Sodom. Make up and all kinds of women going around shorts and choir singers and, and deacons married three or four times and pastors the same way. All that kind of nonsense out there. Go on out. Preach it, Billy. Stay with it. He can't do nothing else. But I remember there was one of them who stayed behind and brought a, a sign to Abraham. Is that right? The elected church. Not the big bright lights. The big nerve centers and the great flowerly things, the great programs and so forth. It was one who stayed behind with Abraham. Is that right? And he gave him a sign that the time was at hand. Watch what he done. I remember, as he did to Abraham, he does to his seed also. Watch Jesus confirm it, saying it would be that way. Now watch. The angel was sitting, not angel, it was God. He was sitting with his back turned to the tent. And he said, now isn't it strange? Abraham, just a few days before that, his name was changing. Here was a stranger. How did he know his name was Abraham instead of Abram? Where is your wife, Sarah? Not S-A-R-I, Sarah, but S-A-R-A-H, S-A-R-A-H, Sarah, her prince's name. Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? How did he know he was married? How did he know his name was Abraham? How did he know he had a wife? And how did he know his name was Sarah? Now watch. The Bible said, Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. She wasn't like the modern women had to take the husband's place and be a policeman on the street and every little place. And no wonder they ain't going to work for man. <laughs> That's right. Woman took his place. This is a woman's nation, you know. She's got a woman's number, a woman's name, everything else, and she is a woman, and a woman will control her. That's right. She stayed in the tent. She kept herself away. Strange man was around. And he, listen, here's the reason he called him Abraham. He said, I, a personal pronoun, I'm going to visit you according to the promise that I give you. Ah, I give you that. That's the reason he knows his name was Abraham. And Abraham had just fed him the meat of a calf. Give him some milk to drink from the cow. Had him some corn cakes made in butter. 
eat butter, cornbread, or bread, and cakes, and drunk milk, and eat a flesh of a calf, and was God in flesh. Right. Now, if you want to argue with the Bible, see if it came capital L-O-R-D, Elohim. Abraham was one talked to him. Abraham called him Lord God. So I guess he ought to know he's one talking. <laughs> Someone said, you don't believe that. I sure do believe it. Every word of it. And just watch how it comes out to the seed of Abraham now. Say, where is your wife, Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you according to the promise that I gave you, the time of life. Twenty-five years ago, I called you under justification. I give you the confirmation of the covenant. I filled you with my own life and yet nourished you up to this place now to give you strength to receive this that I promised you. And now I'm going to give you a sign that I'm going to burn this earth and the time is at hand because you got some seeds going to follow you, you see. He said, I'm going to do this for you, Abraham. And Sarah, back in the tent, said, kind of laughed within herself, saying in her heart, Listen, church, don't fail to see it. The scripture speaking itself. Sarah laughed within herself saying, how could I? An old woman here, nearly a hundred years old, and my husband, forgive me, sisters, be a wife and live in pleasure like a young man and woman with my husband. Why he's, he's in other words, part of a man, he's, he, that had ceased many years ago. And her, they were old. Said, how can I ever have pleasure again with my husband? Called him the Lord. Said, he's old to his strength's gone. It isn't with us as young people anymore to live like that. How can we ever do it? And the man, God dwelling in flesh, the man with his back turned to the tent said, why did Sarah laugh? Saying in her heart that this can't be so. Told what Sarah was doing and what Sarah thought in her heart when she laughed to herself. Is that right? What was it just a little bit before destruction? He's doing the same thing to the seed of Abraham. And they don't recognize it, brother. You know what I mean? Justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost, placing of the Son, and a God dwelling in His church, human flesh, eating, drinking like man, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, dwelling in the sons of Abraham, manifesting the same thing in Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. You get it? Now, one more thing. Then what happened? To receive the oncoming Son, what did he do? He had to do something to Sarah. To Abraham too. Look, he was... Now, sisters, uh, we're in a mixed crowd. You forgive me. But it has ceased to be his husband and wife with them. So he had to do something to them. Now Sarah, the Bible said her womb was dead and Abraham as a man was as good as dead. Is that right? Years had ceased to be with them. Many, many years back. To be husband and wife in the way of sexual order. What did he do? Now if he, we know he had to do something to Sarah... Because her womb was dead. He'd have to make her womb fertile. Is that right? Well, women didn't smoke cigarettes in them days, so they had to raise their bottle up, their baby on cow's milk from the bottle. They had only one way to raise them, from the breast. So her, an old woman like that, God had to make milk veins there. They done dried up. And I want to ask you something. As I go on, forgive me, sisters in a mixed audience, but you listen to your doctor. I'm your brother. How would an old woman a hundred years old go in labor and give birth to a child? If a 45-year-old woman went in labor today, the doctors would have respiration and everything else there for her. And here's a woman a hundred years old about it, with no artificial respiration. He had to do something. What did he do? He just made her new again. 
prove it? Yes, sir. They took a trip 300 miles to Greer, and when they got down there, this little old grandma, Amalek, fell in love with her, the most beautiful woman he ever saw. Abraham straightened up, hair got black again, Sarah become beautiful. See, he just made a new creature so that they could live together again like young men and women. What was he doing? He had to get them in condition to receive the promised son. What's the next thing after this sign goes away? God's going to condition Abraham's children getting ready to receive the promised son. How are we going to receive him? We can't receive him in these bodies. We're going to meet him in the air. Praise God forever. The trumpet shall sound the dead and Christ shall rise and we'll go up to meet him in the air. What's he doing? The last sign before the transfiguration, the last sign before the rapture, for most any time the atomic bombs going to destroy the world, before it screams into this case, Jesus is coming, we which are alive and remain shall not prevent or hinder those that are asleep dead, for the trumpet of God shall sound the dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive shall be changed in a moment of a twinkling of an eye. An old man will be young, an old woman will be young again. And we'll be conditioned to meet the promised coming son. Hey! Hallelujah! The next thing is God's order. What happened? Just as the angel had his back turned and showing that sign to Abraham... He brought everything down through justification, sanctification, baptism, Holy Ghost, placing of sons, gifts and orders coming out, and then showing his last sign before destruction, and then changed Abraham's seed. It might come before we close the meeting. Old brother kid sitting here and sister kid, old veterans of the war. Watch in a moment, be standing there and become a young man and woman again. Change. Why we have to be changed? It was totally impossible for that old man to have sexual relationship with his wife. It was totally impossible for her to conceive and bear a child as the supernatural taking place. And the only way it could be done would be have to be a transformation of her body. He had lived with her since she's eighteen years old or sixteen. His half sister, he married her young. And she was barren and he was sterile. You see it? And so he had to change their physical being to receive the Son. Oh, church. He'll have to change this physical being to let us be caught up. We can't go up this kind of a body. He'll change our body in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. We'll be caught up together in the air. Come meet the Lord in the air. We can't go up like this. We see every sign, justification, sanctification, filling of the Holy Ghost, the placing of sun, the last sign being given. Amen. Do you believe it? Oh, I, I'm just going to have to cut it off here. I can't go on. Let's bow our heads. Church of the living God. God be merciful. Don't you want to break away from these old sound barriers here and be ready to meet Him? If there is people who isn't ready to meet him. And you know, if the trumpet would sound, that you'd still be earthbound here. To go through that great, horrible tribulation, like those who was turned out of the ark, they perished in the water. Children, teenagers, there was without mercy, they all drowned in their dead carcasses floated on the waters and there were crows and buzzards eat from them. Them that was in the ark was safe. The days of Noah, everything that was sinful, destroyed. In the days of Sodom, everything in Sodom burned. Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt. Miserably degraded 
But none of those things touched Noah. None of them touched Abraham. Neither will any touch the seed of Abraham. I have brought you the gospel. I have not called myself this. But you have said that you believe that God called me to be his prophet. What does the word prophet mean in Hebrew? A divine interpreter of the written word. The word of the Lord came to the prophet or the seer. I've told you the truth. Now will you receive Christ as your savior, healer, baptizer, coming king? If you're not ready to meet him in the air and if he'd come tonight and you know you're not ready, would you, with your, while your heads are bowed, would you just raise your hands and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. God be merciful to me. I know I'm not ready. Now it's up to you. I'm not, it's not begging time. It's time to wake up and be man or women or if your heart is sinned away the day of grace then you'll, no matter what condition you need, you don't even know it. But is there anything about you that's woke you up to let you realize that the hour we're living and you want to be remembered in prayer, raise up your hand. God bless you. You, 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 you. To my right, you, you, you. God bless you. It goes to show the Holy Spirit still speaking to people. The door is not closed yet. But listen to me as his servant. The hour is coming when you'll no more put up your hand. It's done hit that for many people. There's people sitting right here now that I know in the name of the Lord. Looking out over them and seeing that blackness over them. I know they should put up their hands and they didn't do it. They've sinned their last day of grace away. Turned away from the truth. Committed. He that sins willfully after he received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin but a fearful looking for the judgment of our indignation. Heavenly Father, they raise their hands. I've done my best at the Word. That's all I know. I've said it just as you reveal it. We've waited long, and now there's many put up their hands, a dozen maybe in this building, maybe more, maybe less. But I'd say eventually you know them every one. The Holy Spirit has spoke to them through the Word. They realize that they're not ready to go. Heavenly Father, if a person is sincere enough to put up their hands and witness to you that they're not ready and they desire to be ready, won't you, kind, merciful Father, condition their hearts tonight for the going away pretty soon to meet the promised Son? He's been promised now for 2,000 years. We've waited for him, and soon he's coming because we see that everything that he done to Abraham, he has done to his seed. We have the last sign with us now that you, God, is manifested in human flesh. They raise their hands, Lord. They, the Bible says your own son, Jesus Christ, said, He that heareth my words, and God, I, I brought it to him, and will believe on him that sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come to the judgment, but pass from death to life. Great Jehovah Elohim, through the name of Jesus Christ, I give them to you as tokens of your word and the sacrifice of your loving Son. And by the presence of the Holy Ghost, who brings the word and manifests it through human flesh to the people. They are yours. Do with them as you see fit, Lord, for they are in your hands. Your ministers here will lead them on. May they go straight to some good church and have Christian baptism performed. Then may they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and be placed in the body of Christ. Grant it, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. It is five minutes until ten o'clock. I haven't time for a prayer line. I'll catch him tomorrow night. I will, Lord willing. I'll just finish up this little bitty message and run my prayer around. Are you sick? Are you needy? Raise your hands if you want. God bless you. If you're sick and needy, I've told you in this Bible that God, what he did to Abraham there, he also promised it to his son 
his sons of Abraham, and the main seed son of Abraham made the promise as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Just the same sign that God showed to Abraham that the end of sinful believers was, or sinful professors was at hand, so would it be in the days of his coming. Is that right? Now, I am your brother, a man. Now, I'm going to ask you to be real quiet just a minute, if you will. Be real reverent. I am your brother, a man. No matter what God would ever do for me, he has to do for you too to make it work. Jesus was God's son. He came to earth. Do you believe that? And when he come to earth, what did he do? There was times that he got among his people that didn't believe in him. Their, their churches turned the people away from him. Is that right? That's what they're doing today. We find him in the ladies in church age, outside the church, knocking, trying to get back in. They've done the same thing today. And many mighty works he could not do because of their unbelief. But as many as believed him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. Is that right? Now I'm going to ask you something. You bow your head, you that's sick. How many knows that, that Jesus Christ is a high priest sitting at the right hand of God right now, by the sacrifice, tore apart, sent the Holy Ghost down here, and, it's, and if you believe me to be his servant, his, if you want to... No, I ain't going to say that. I'm, I'm his servant. Not even worthy to be called a minister, let alone a prophet. But if you believe that I've told you the truth, don't believe me, but believe what the Word says. See if God keeps his word. He's sitting at the right hand of God and is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Is that true? The Bible says that? Well, if he's the same, Hebrews 13, 8, the same yesterday, day, and forever, if you touched him with your infirmities, how would he act if he was the same yesterday and forever? The way he acted when the woman touched his garment. Could you touch him? The Bible said so. Well, then he'd act the same. Then remember he said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Now the vine doesn't bear any fruit. The branch bears the fruit, but gets its life from the vine. Is that right? Now he's here. We are the branches. If you've got something wrong with you, and you need help from God, I'll ask you to pray. And say, Heavenly Father, that little uneducated, <laughs> dried up man standing up there, bald headed, how? He don't know me. And he's just a man. But he tells me that you're the same and made this confirmation that, and everything that I see, I see that's true justification, sanctification, baptism, Holy Ghost, placing of the Son, giving him the name, the man taking part of the name of God, Elohim. Now let's see the same sign. We see Billy Graham falling down in Sodom. But this man says, there'll be one come to the elected church. Now, you see, brethren, is that scriptural? Amen. Then believe. And if God says, confirms what I say to be the truth, then it is the truth. You pray. And I'll yield myself. You yield yourself. See what the Holy Spirit will say. Now the Bible said the angel had his back turned to the tent. Now anybody here that knows me, please don't pray. If you know me and know that I know your troubles, don't you pray. Just those who doesn't know me and knows that I don't know nothing about you, you pray. See what he will do. I just be, just be in prayer. The Lord Jesus, this ministry is soon coming to the end. I believe that soon this will end. I believe the coming of the expected son to the seed of Abraham will soon arrive. But that your word might be fulfilled, Lord, let it be known tonight that you are God and I am your prophet or your servant. 
born, sent, ordained for this work. That it might be a sign to the church, to the elected, called out seed of Abraham, that the end as the hand. Let it be so, Lord. Let some of Abraham's seed there touch the hem of your garment. Then speak to me, Father, to say the words that you had me to say. Now you pray. Now before me, with my back turned to the audience, there's a woman sitting back in this away. She's suffering with a stomach trouble. She also has had a car accident. She is not from here. She's from Kentucky. Her name is Miss Ellison. Stand on your feet, baby, and receive your healing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be healed. Now the lady... I've never seen her in my life. If we're strangers, lady, raise up your hand. The lady that was just healed, raise up your hand. Is he still God? Now, I ask some of the rest of you to do the same thing. I'll turn my hand. Straight behind the woman is a woman also suffering. She's got a kidney infection, rather heavy like woman. Mrs. Brown, you stand up and receive your healing. Am I a stranger to you? We're strangers to one another. I didn't know nothing about you. If that's right, raise up your hand, but you were praying. God bless you. Go be well. Is God still God? If thou canst believe. Back trouble and kidney trouble. Down the road there, Miss Day, you want to receive your healing. You may receive it also. I don't know the woman, never seen her in my life. If that's right, lady, wave your hand. We don't know one another. See? What is it? Your faith to believe. If thou canst believe all things are possible. Is that right? What about in this section, somewhere in here? Have faith. There's a man standing before me. He's had an operation for hemorrhoid. Didn't do any good. Mr. Day... I beg your pardon, Mr. Sharp. Stand up and receive your healing. With my Bible before me, I never seen the man in my life. We're total strangers, one to the other. With the growth in the nose back there, Miss Bolin. What about you? Will you stand and receive your healing? I don't know her, never seen her in my life. Do you believe with all your heart? The lady with the leg trouble, fixing for an operation over there, Miss Connor, stand up and receive your healing. Fallen bladder sitting next there. Fixing for an operation, Miss Dixon, stand up and receive your healing. I've never seen him in my life, and God is my judge. This is the end time, church. 
God called Abraham by justification, sanctification, the spirit, placing of a son, and appeared in human flesh before the end time. You believe it? How many of you that raised your hand a while ago now that you want to be remembered in prayer? You've never seen anything like it before. Now you're glad you received Christ as your Savior. Stand up on your feet. You that believes that you're glad you received Christ as your Savior. Stand up on your feet. Every one of you. Now, you're not ashamed of God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. That's right. Keep. That's right. God bless you. How many wants to be healed now and believes that he's here to heal you? See, I never touched those people. There's 10 or 12 more people, whatever it was, went through the building. I never touched a one of them, but they touched something. This microphone is a mute. That's something speaking to it. I'm a mute too on anything like that. How would I know it? God, they touched God. God spoke through me and told them the very thing that they were wanting. Is that right? Does that make him the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then I asked you, every one of you that need healing in your body, to stand on your feet in the name of Jesus Christ. Church, you see these people who want healing. How many near them are believers? Raise up your hands. The Bible said these signs shall follow them that believe. You stand up by them and lay your hands on them. You lay your hands on them. Now lay your hands on each other as you go around for the audience. That's in me. Now how do you pray at your church? The way you pray at your church, you, the way you pray to God in the secret closet, pray for that person you got your hands on while I pray for all of you. Our Heavenly Father, it has been a lengthy meeting, but one that no doubt will always be remembered. That we're at the end time and we see it. We're here tonight where we are a people who knows that the time is at hand. There's no nation, no one can keep this, no person can keep it from happening. God said so. And his words are true as we've seen every confirmation that he spoke of. And now, your great spirit is here in the building. Beyond any shadow of doubt, the same God that preached the message, the same spirit that spoke, is the same one that proved that he's the same one that was in human flesh, eating and drinking like a man, sitting before Abraham, before the end time was for that generation. So is it now, Lord. The end time is here. And these people know that Jesus, the Son of God, said that these things would reappear again like it was in Sodom before the end time. Lord God, we are without one shadow of doubt. It's here. They are praying for one another. They are believers. They rise to confess their belief. They lay their hands on one another to pray for one another. I condemn the devil of sickness, diseases, affliction, or sin that's upsetting them. And the unbelief that keeps them from receiving their healing. I ask God to move back the shadows of unbelief and let the Holy Spirit pour into these children of Abraham from El Shaddai, the great strength giver, and heal each of them as I condemn the devil and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. The Son of God.